context of the United States government, the tax by the undead have been reported in several states across the country. The dead are rising from their graves and are attacking the human race. At this time, it is expected that more attacks of this nature will occur in several other states in the next few hours. The intent behind the attack is unknown at this time. He has been observed that a bike for exchange of fluids is a method of transmission. This is an extremely dangerous situation if they crave the taste of human flesh. It is not known whether this event will last for hours, days, or even longer. Stay calm, as authorities have been dispatched to deal with these creatures. An all-clear siren will be sounded when this situation is under control. Your host, Rodney, the Viking Shortridge, co-host, Melinda, the Raven, Jackson. Want to give a big old shout out to the Facebook paranormal groups that allow us to post our shows on their pages and helping us to get the word out about all of our guests. Also, a shout out to the Connor Sisters, hats off to Misty and Ashley. They are the founders of SOS Sisters of Salem Paranormal Research Society and host of their podcast, Paranormal Party. You can find them on Facebook under Paranormal Party. If anyone would like to speak to Black Diamond Paranormal Society, CDPS, to discuss your paranormal questions or issues, go to our website at blackdiamondps.org or email blackdiamondps at yahoo.com. As always, our services are free. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. You can listen in by calling 516 516- 387-1922 or you can go to the Vibe Radio Network website at blogtalkradio.com forward slash Vibe Radio Network or deep within the heart of the Appalachian Mountains I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for listening to Within the Chaos my name is Rodney Shortridge and I'll be your host tonight along with my beautiful Raven Melinda Jack First off, I'd like to give a shout-out to my cousins up in Ohio. Jennifer and Joe, shortage of 222 Paranormal. If you have a chance, check out their talk show. You can find them on Facebook under 222 Paranormal. Uh, Tonight, our special guest is Tiffany Sparks, a.k.a. Lady Outlaw. Uh, Tiffany hails from the heart of West Virginia, deeply rooted in the Appalachian Mountains. The heritage and traditions of her ancestors run through her veins with the force of a thousand horses. She is a modern day woman with a strong presence of the past. Living on the outskirts of society like a pioneer, an outlaw, on a mission of bringing feminine quality to adorn the trade of making spirits. Man, that's gonna be awesome, can't we? Oh, that's me. That's right. I'm the one doing it. Huh? 
Uh, got some a uh, little sad news. Well, it's not really sad. It's just uh, Melinda uh, Jackson. You know, she she'll no longer be on the show. Uh, she's moved on to bigger and brighter things, and you know, I want to thank her for her hard work and her dedication, and uh, for putting up with uh, my bullshit for so long. Uh, so we wish her the best. So now let's go ahead and let me click over. And let me see if I get her on. Uh, it's my honor to welcome again our special guest, Tiffany Sparks. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, uh, it's such an honor to have you on the show. Uh, I hope you can hear me because I've had tech problems past two shows. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. All right. Hey, Rodney. <laughs> how you doing, buddy? I'm doing all right. You? I'm doing good. That's good. That's good. Well, uh, I guess I'll just dig in here and see what we can get to know about each other. <laughs> All right. I was going to ask you if uh, cursing is permitted, because if not, you'd have to le- use a lot of uh, bleep bleeping okay. with me. But I heard you say bullshit, so I'm like, okay, I'm good to go. <laughs> Girl, I, I, I'm like a damn sailor on here, and I, and I don't <laughs> I, even yeah. know what on the water. <laughs> <laughs> good, because I'm known to have a little bit of a potty mouth myself, but I'll try to keep it clean. I, I'm serious, boy. I, 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 my aunt, she passed away uh, Friday, and I went down to the wake Sunday. And uh, a couple of people, I didn't even know who the hell they were. I mean, two women. I mean, we're waiting in line to go up, you know, to see my aunt. And these two women just walk up in front of me. And I'm like, well, what the fuck do you think y'all are doing? <laughs> You know, they turn oh, and look at me, and I'm like, I don't give a damn if we are at a wake. You know, wait your fucking turn. You know? <laughs> That's right. No skipping line. Yeah, my mom got mad at me. She's like, shut up. You're embarrassing me. I'm like, hey, this is who I am. <laughs> the family knows the girl sitting there going, damn, don't piss him off. <laughs> Actually, I was watching, um, there's a movie on Netflix called Get Low. It has uh, Robert Duvall in it. And I had read an article about this man that lived in Tennessee in the 1800s. And he wanted to have a funeral party while he was still alive. So he did, and they publicized it in the newspapers and photographed him going to get fitted for his suit. He made his own casket and everything. And um, and he, I think there was like 12,000 people that showed up for this funeral party. They had like music and hot dog stands and stuff. <laughs> and he just sat there on a chair in front of his casket greeting the people and letting them tell stories about him or, you know, give, pay their respects to him in person. I thought, well, you know, that's actually a really good idea to do it. Yeah. So, that's you know, opposite like. way around that way, you know, people can pay their respects while you're still alive. I was like, well, shit, I might plan my own funeral party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, if I knew in time that, you know, I, I was going to die, if it's like a set time, I would. That's what I'd want. I'd have a big old damn hold down. And let everybody just, you know, this is your final moment to tell me how you mm-hmm. actually feel about me. And it kind of makes sense me, to do it that way, doesn't it? No, it does to me. And <laughs> you, you say, well, Ron, I've always thought you was an asshole. I'll be, I'll be looking at you going, yep, and I've always thought you was an <laughs> asshole, too. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'll start out by asking you, you know, about yourself and, you know, and, and what started you on the, on the path of making spirit? <clears throat> well, what, what first sparked my interest in the whole moonshine business to begin with, um, my grandmother as a, as a young child would tell me a story about her daddy making moonshine up on the mountain. And she would tell about her mother uh, dressing up as a revenue man, and she would go up and shoot a still all to hell, and she'd say, you know, moonshine flowed down off that mountain for a month. And she told that story over and over, and every time she told it, I thought, well, what was so wrong with what that old man was doing that the great-grandma went up there and shot it all to hell? You know, like, that's not very nice. So that's kind of what got my interest first in the in the train. Um, and then, of course, being from the Appalachian Mountains is a big part of the culture here, you know, because people have used that as a way, you know, a, re- a resource of income, secondary income, um, you know, because Appalachians are typically – economically deprived and you know people have used that for you know generations to get by you know to put food on the table for their families and roof over their heads and and so I've always had a big respect for the trade because of that 
and I actually ended up getting involved in the trade. I I was married for 15 years, and when I got a divorce as a single mother, um, I wasn't making enough money to put food on the table for my kids, and so I thought I've got to do something else. So that's when I started bootlegging and uh, making a secondary income from that, and I did that for a couple years before I actually started making liquor myself, and that's just kind of how the whole thing started up. Well, for people that may not know, what is a bootlegger? I know, bootleggers but... <laughs> transport. Yeah, you're you're basically it's the most dangerous job in the whole trade. You're the one who transports it, you know, either across state lines or from one county to another, or one town to another, and that's you know that that's the most risky part of it because that's when you could get busted by the law and end up in prison. So <clears throat> you have to be the most careful with that whole part. And a lot of people that make moonshine hire bootleggers to transport for them so they don't get caught, you know, they don't get in, in trouble if uh if they get caught hauling it. So that's I did that for a couple years and I actually uh was caught by the law one time for bootlegging, but it was because I told on myself. <laughs> they would have never known I had it if I hadn't opened my big mouth and I told on myself, but I didn't get in trouble. So that's good. <laughs> well, yeah. what what is moonshine exactly for the ones you know for people out there may not know? Moonshine is corn whiskey distilled. Um, they call it moonshine because typically, you know, back in the day, it was done at nighttime during the dark out in the woods, you know, to keep the revenues from finding you. But um, it's done so many different ways now. I personally make it in my house uh, on an electric still because we have the um, the infrared helicopters that fly over where we live, and they'll pick up the heat of a still in the woods. So I actually cook mine beside my wood-burning stove in the house. And, uh, well, that's cool. Yeah, illegal untaxed corn whiskey. It's always the best. Uh, the, yeah, it is. Now, um, my grandfather, he, he, you know, like you said, everybody in this area, your area, my area, Kentucky, Tennessee, we all families have had a little bit of shiner somewhere down the line. But, you know, I've always heard that uh, uh, you, you can maybe back me up on this or not. Uh, there's something special about the water here that flows through the mountains of uh, of the Appalachians. Is, is, is that true as far as making? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and good water is everything with making good liquor. And that, that definitely is true for this region. We have plenty of good water sources to gather from. And But, yeah, like you said, you know, it's been – most everyone who's grown up in Appalachia or is from this area has had some moonshine background in their family history. And for me, it was um, two of my great grandfathers. One of them was a bootlegger. And then the one I told you about was a moonshiner. And then my great, great grandfather was a moonshiner down in the coal field too. So, and as far as I know, I'm the first one in my family to join the trade since them. So it's been, it's, it has skipped a few generations in my family. Hmm. Well, uh, when did you have your first taste of uh, uh, moonshine? Oh, my first taste of it? Oh, gosh. Yeah. It's hard to tell. I'd, I'd say it was probably, probably from one of my family members sitting on a front porch somewhere here in West Virginia. <laughs> I don't remember. I've had so much of it since then, though. But um, And then, of course, I have my legal line out, the Outlaw Spirits with East Tennessee Distillery. <laughs> now your now your legal line. Uh, how long did it take you to uh, 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 go to? I mean, is that just your your special recipe that they they make, or is it something that? Uh, well, the Outlaw uh, Spirits line. Uh, me and Shane McCoy from the Hatfield McCoy family. Uh, we are both on that particular line with East Tennessee Distillery. Um, the master distiller there, Tiny Robertson, has his own line that's called Robertson Mellow Moon, Tennessee Mellow Moon. And um, he just decided to start a new line, and uh, he put me and Shane on that one. And I've got the 80 proof untamed, and Shane has the 80 proof underground rye. And uh, and I'm hoping to get a, a flavor on there soon on the Outlaw Spirits line. But it took me, it took probably about three years of me 
kind of courting legal distilleries before I found the right fit, and that was with Tiny. So I've noticed. Is it is it hard to to, uh, to deal with a distillery here in Virginia, or because I've noticed, especially off the show, uh, everybody's kind of going out of state because Virginia's. Like yeah, Virginia real- is actually one of the most difficult states to do the legal liquor in. Um, and Kentucky is hard, too, because Kentucky is so much bourbon country. You know, they, they're they not really looking to do much moonshine. Um, but, yeah, Virginia is definitely one of the hardest. North Carolina is a hard state to get into. Um, right now, I'm only in Tennessee and West Virginia, and it took a long time to get in both of those states. Um but yeah, it's just it's a process process of getting through red tape and state laws, bureaucracy. It's not easy at all being on the legal market. I, I way underestimated how difficult it would be on this uh-huh. side of the fence for the industry. But well, how, how do you get into the state? Is it that is it uh, uh, what is the process? Uh, do do they test your product first or how does that work well like for for west virginia um i contacted the west virginia abc and then we set up a meeting for the distillery to go before the board of the abc and we took our products in there and gave them a brief overview of what we did what we do who we are and then they basically make a decision um whether or not they're going to accept it into the state and then Tiny has 13 different flavors, and then we have two uh, labels on the Outlaw Spirits line. And so they accepted some of those in the the warehouse, and some of them are special order, so they can be ordered from the liquor stores, you know, and brought into the warehouse. But that's pretty much, you know, but that alone, it sounds like a pretty easy process, but that alone took like a year to make happen. So... Oh, wow. It's a pretty lengthy, yeah, you have to have a lot of patience in this business. And then uh, going from there, you have to get around to all the different liquor stores. And West Virginia is like a hybrid state. It's a state state control. It's a control state, but then the uh, liquor stores are privately owned. So where, mm-hmm. like, Tennessee is a private state, so all the liquor stores there are privately, uh, privately owned. Uh, North Carolina is a control state. Um, I'm not sure what Virginia is. I haven't really looked into Virginia, honestly, because I know it's a difficult one to get into, but they're all different. It's not, you know, like with the Moonshiner show, you got Sugarlands, which is mass produced pretty much everywhere because the TV show boosts the demand for it. Um, mm-hmm. So it's probably in every state. I'm not sure, but then they have Gatlinburg that works in their favor too. You know, all the traffic that goes through Gatlinburg every day. It's a big mm-hmm consumer of the sugar lands and the bigger old smoky and the bigger distilleries mm. like that but well well you know back in the day uh shannon was you know normally a male dominated business you know have um with 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 the women today i know there's a few women back in the day that uh, did shining but uh uh, how are you, you as yourself as a woman being in the business, uh, ha- have you been able to change that stereotype about it being just a male uh, dominated um, business? I hope so. I mean, that's one of my goals, honestly. And, and it is still um, predominantly male trade, um, both the legal and the illegal sides of the business but you know there's women like Pam Sutton Patty Bryan that's on the show Teresa Kimmer Mays on the show women like that have paved the way for other women to join the trade and I have noticed since all of us have been in the industry that there are more women stepping up and maybe they've been like closet moonshiners or maybe they just gained interest in it I'm not sure but I have noticed a trend of more women joining the trade in the last several years so mm-hmm. Well, I know you, everybody, you know, even with my family and stuff, you know, they talk about the heritage of uh, moonshine and uh, and and whiskey and everything. Uh, what 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 does the heritage 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 mean to you, like for the future for your kids and your grandkids? 
Would you want to well, pass to me, the, the heritage of the trade is where most of my respect lies uh, with the industry. It's not about alcohol to me. The moonshining business is about heritage and history and passing down an art, you know, through the generations. And um, it is something I, I have not taught my children how to make it yet. I do make them take a sip of it when they're sick. And, of course, they know that that's, you know, mommy's job. Uh, but <clears throat> I do intend to teach it to them one day so that they can pass it down to their children and on, you know, if they would like to. Um, but to me, that's that's where the majority of my respect really does lie with the trade is the whole heritage of it. Because especially for the Appalachian region, like I said before, the reason why it's bigger in the Appalachians and in other part of the country is because we've had to rely, Appalachian, you know, mountain people have had to rely on that as a, another source of income, you know, mm-hmm. to just help to support their family. So. Well, how has it changed your life? Oh gosh, that's a big question. Um, well, it's definitely made me more of a public figure. I was very much of a, um, <laughs> kind of a hermit before I joined the train and for whatever reason um, I have become somewhat well known in the industry Uh, so you know with that there comes a lot of the events and things that I do to go out and meet the people that follow me and support me and so that that keeps me really busy you know and I'm here on the farm so just the farm itself is a full-time job and you know, I've also got kids that I'm raising and a husband and, you know, other things that I have to do too. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, the moonshine trade is my job. So that's, you know, it, it does take up a lot of my time. And then there's the the whole social part of it too, which is sometimes hard to keep up with. But I try my best to get on the road and get to all, as many of the events as I can make it to in a year. Well, I, I've noticed in I don't know if a lot of people know this, but I'm sure you know. Uh, why is it that uh, most of the shine that they're making out in the woods is done during the uh, uh, spring, summer, fall months and not in the winter? Well, you, you have to have your mash at the right temperature. Your mash won't work off if it's too cold. So, And that's one reason. Another reason why I do it in the house is because you I actually use a heat band and you can do it year round uh like that. But if you're doing it outside you have the temperatures have to be right for you for the mash to work off. Okay. So there well, is a season mm-hmm. associated with it. Mhm. Well you mentioned that you you know you are kind of being well known, but you know, what's it like to be in the spotlight now that, you know, uh you you're you're becoming more well known uh for uh you know, your heritage and also uh, your spirits. And so, uh, uh, and I know you're out there and I know you mentioned it also about, you know, you you feel like it's becoming a lost art. How can you, uh, how can uh, uh, people like you change that and educate the public? uh, You know, because I'm sure it's more to it than what they show on the show. I'm sure there's a lot of legal aspects. Yeah, which I think, um, and I haven't kept up with the show every season because I I haven't even had TV for like the past 10 years. Um, I I did see the first two seasons I had ordered from a video store and watched them a long time ago. And then I I didn't watch it again until this season. I downloaded the Discovery app so I could watch because I have a lot of new friends that are on this season, which I'm I'm friends with almost the entire cast of the show. Uh, But, you know, Donnie and Teresa just came on. Van Fields, Jeff Edwards, uh, Brad Phillips, Red Fox. Um, so I've been trying to watch. I've I've actually missed like the last three weeks because I've been busy on the farm. But I have been trying to watch this season to support them and my other friends on the show. Um, but I think actually the TV show has done a pretty good job as far as putting the art and the trade of moonshine back in the mainstream. I mean, there's not unless you're hiding under a rock somewhere. I mean, even me who doesn't have TV knows of the show and the people on it and everything. So. Well, have they asked you to be on the show? No, actually I, I was signed with the Appalachian outlaws for the history channel uh, for season two. 
and that's actually how I became somewhat more well known. I was pretty much a a private person until that whole ordeal came about, and uh, it kind of just fell out of the sky on my lap uh, when the History Channel hired me. And that's actually Tiny was the only moonshiner on that show. I think he was on the first season of it. And then uh, most of my best friends actually were cast members of that show. Greg Shook, Ewok, um, there's a, a, that whole the whole cast and everyone that was associated with that show I still keep in regular contact with. And then uh, Ewok actually married me and my husband. He was the preacher at our wedding. and But that that's where I first became actually known to people. And how people started knowing me for Moonshine, I was bootlegging during this time <clears throat> that I was working for the show. And I had never met Greg Shook, and of course he's one of the main characters from the Appalachian Outlaws. And uh, I had Moonshine in my house, and the producers told me that Greg Shook came in my house and stole my Moonshine while I was gone. And I'm like, well, who is this Greg Shook motherfucker? Because I'm going to find him and whoop his ass. Like, <laughs> you just... He, I don't know where he's from or who he is, but he obviously doesn't know better that you don't just go in someone's house and steal their moonshine, right? Yeah. So I, they had me believing this for like a couple months, and I sent him a message, and I was like, how is my moonshine? He's like, oh, it's good. Thank you. And come to find out, he was never in my house, and he never stole my moonshine. It was the producers that took it and drank it, which, you know, <clears throat> the behind the scenes of TV shows is what really should be on the screen because that's where the most interesting shit is. But I had it out for Greg for a while till I found out it wasn't him, and uh, and now he's one of my best friends in the whole world. But that's uh, that's kind of how people started knowing that I was even in the moonshine train is when that whole incident took place. And I was, you know, I don't know if you've seen the show, but there was a scene where Ewok left Greg Strick on the side of the river, and he actually got death threats from that. But oh, you know, wow. anytime yeah. someone would say something about that on Facebook, I'm like, yeah, that motherfucker stole my moonshine. <laughs> 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 so, which is it's just so funny to me now because I love Greg Shug dearly. He's one of my best friends in the whole world. But, but well, yeah, that's was, that's kind of how I became now. <laughs> yeah, I, I watched the show. I really enjoyed the show. But when I seen Greg come up from Georgia, I'm like. Uh, who's this motherfucker coming into the air neck of the woods getting their damn thing? You know, I, I yeah. got a problem with that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> my wife was like, you need to calm it down. I'm like, hey, I don't give a shit. You know, I, I was, you know, I was big thing when I was a kid and everything. And I'm like, it takes yeah. everything. This son of a bitch is coming up here taking their shit. Who the hell do you think he is? Well, see, the ginseng industry is a lot like the moonshine industry and the and the fact that Appalachians have used that as an another source of income, you know, mm-hmm. <clears throat> through the generations. And I used to gather ginseng with my grandma as a child, and uh, so they they kind of run along the parallel lines with each other, both the industries. But yeah, they sure do. And like I said, I I, I even took offense to it because I, you know I did, you know. It, and watching these people try to steal a people's thing, I'm like, what in the hell is going on? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah see, I, I live in the town where Tony Kaufman, uh, which is a big ginseng buyer, that's where his business is, and he lives about five miles down the road from me, and he's actually the one that got me signed up with Appalachian Outlaws. He knew of me just from Facebook, um, and I was just, you know, only known as a farmer to people back then but you know he followed me on there and he he's the one that gave them my name and I was actually the first female signed to that cast and um but going back to you asked why I have been on the moonshiner so I was associated with the Appalachian Outlaws with History Channel and now I'm signed with a different production company which is DNA Films and I do have some projects coming up with them that I'm not allowed to talk about I called my producer earlier. I'm like, what can I say? It's a two-hour long interview. I'm going to say something I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> and uh, I know you've had the Southern Gypsies on your show and uh, the Connor sisters. Oh, yeah. I've known them. Ashley and Misty. They're who, aren't they? The Southern Gypsies are awesome. I love them. But yeah, they're actually I'm, signed I'm... with the same production company I am with. So I was like, what can I say about the Southern Gypsies? She's like, you got to just, you know, you can't give out too many secrets. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've known them like they're about eleven years. They're 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 two of my uh, I guess best friends too. And 
uh, we've we've partied and we've cussed and bitched at people and <laughs> made fun of them. <laughs> Yeah, we go way back. <laughs> they're hilarious. I was telling my producer, I'm like, you know what I love about the Southern Gypsies? I'm like, they're inappropriate as fuck, and that's my kind of people. <laughs> yeah, which they so are. They're like, hilarious. That's how I caught on. See, I, I met them God, like said, about 11 years ago, and I'm gonna be honest with you, they didn't look like they look today. They looked all homely back in the day. I, I told them, I said, oh, y'all. Yeah. I'm like, y'all, y'all, y'all living under a bridge or something? Oh, fuck you. <laughs> like, oh, they will talk like it is. There's some straight shooters. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, we've had a fall. I love them to death. They, they good oh, people. I do, too. Yeah, I actually, I stayed the night in their headquarters with uh, Holly and Misty, and Ashley was at the hotel behind us, but... um. Holly and Missy are a riot, man. And I, I had some uh, 184.4 proof moonshine that my my boss made, and and I think Holly drank like half a bottle of it. I don't know how she was still standing, but <clears throat> they oh, yeah. just had me dying laughing. I was scared to death, but then they passed out, and the house starts doing creepy shit, you know. And I'm like, oh god, I can't wake them up because they don't have too much to drink. <laughs> Well, see, we investigated that house uh, about, uh, we've investigated it about three or four times, but uh, Rhonda contacted me about four or five years ago about coming down there and looking into it, and my gosh, that place, it, it is, it's got a, for me, I'm I'm one of these really skeptical people, but, you know, just sitting there and listening and seeing some of the shit I've seen, I'm like, yeah, you got something going on down here, woman. Yeah, wow. if you're not a believer, that that house will make you a believer. I, I've been there, and I don't know why I keep going back, because I am terrified. Like, I am literally scared to death of this place, and I keep going back. Like, something compels me to go back there. So I've been, like, I don't know, half a dozen times, and I've stayed the night about five times. And every time I stay, like, something worse happens than the time before, other than the last time I stayed when I had my kids with me, the house was pretty well behaved that night. But <clears throat> the night I was there with Holly and Misty, we were all sleeping in the room off of the um, the smaller dining room. And Misty had hung a sheet up in the doorway, you know, to block out any spirits from bothering us while we were asleep. And I see a shadow start walking back and forth. I'm like, oh, no, Mm-mm, my phone battery was dead. My stuff was, like, on the other end of the house, and I just laid there, and I kept thinking, okay, it's going to go away. I'm just imagining it. I closed my eyes and look again, and there it was. And it it walked back and forth for an hour, and every so often it would, like, stop a face towards me, and I just sat there petrified. I mean, I was scared shitless. <laughs> well, I know the last, last time we were down there investigating, uh, we were in that room where they do their seances and stuff, and it was me, Robin, and Melinda, and... Robin and Melinda was on each side of me. We were sitting there watching the monitor. Scott and Jeff was upstairs and that over at little landing and just everybody just sitting there shooting the shit. And uh all of a sudden you hear right in between you know, it was like it was right in my face, you hear a Oh my god. I turned around, looked at Robin, and I swear her eyes looked like about to really pop out of her head and I looked at Melinda, <laughs> the same thing. I said, I take it y'all fucking heard that too. <laughs> oh, I would piss my pants. I see. I've never heard anyone talk in there, but I have heard whistling. And um, the first time I was there, I was in there by myself and I was doing a Facebook live interview. And if I had known what I know about this house now, I would have never, ever, ever been in there by myself. But, you know, I thought I was all big and brave. and But you can tell, like, when you're in that house, it feels like something's trying to chase you out of there, doesn't it? Well, I, I don't get that feeling. I, I just get a feeling that there's something there, a lot of something. Uh, I feel like we... there's something trying to chase my ass out of there. But I was trying to do a live video because I was, I was nervous to be there by myself. So I thought, oh, I'll just take the people of Facebook with me, you know. And uh, I ended up being such a chicken on that video and I had tried to take him down to the cellar and I got halfway down and I heard something in the cellar so I took off running and left the door open when I ran and took off to the front porch and then I went back a few minutes later and the door was shut and I couldn't open it it was it was almost like it was locked and I was sitting there fighting with it <clears throat> and I finally got it pulled open just barely and something jerked it back shut like jerked it away from me and I took off again, and I waited till my friends, Greg Shook and uh, his friends, got there. And when we went back, the door was standing wide open. 
So, <clears throat> but that that was my first experience at that house. But I've told people this before. Do you notice a difference when Rhonda's there? Because I feel like when Rhonda's there, the house is quiet. And then as soon as she leaves, it's like, all right. Yeah, I've noticed Time that to too. Time to scare the I... shit out of some people. Yeah, she's she's even talked about that, that, you know, she, she may see a few, uh, feel a few things or hear a few things, but she said it always seems like as soon as she leaves, everything, you know, gets more active around people. Yeah, yeah, because I'm not scared when she's there, even though the first time I was there with her and she gave me a tour, there was some stuff going on in the house, but I just feel safe when she's there, and as soon as she leaves, it seems like everything gets so much more active. Well, I, I know the first time we were down there, uh, it was cold as fuck. They didn't have no heat or nothing in there. And we were staying in like an hour at a time, and I had a group in there. And it was time for them to come out. And I, I parked the van down there at, at their driveway, and I was watching them walk out, coming down the uh, the walkway. All of a sudden, I seen like a, like a lantern or a candlelight uh, up in the top window, go across the window and start coming down the steps. And I, I was just, I, I was just frozen to look at it because I couldn't believe what the fuck I was seeing. And then when I looked around to see if anybody else was looking, they're all looking towards the fucking road. Oh man! Me? <laughs> <laughs> they missed it. Oh no! So I take off and go up there, and they're like, "What? What? What? What?" And I said, "I've seen a candlelight, like." A lantern or something walking down the steps. So, you know, we go up there, we try to find it, try to buck it, cut. we couldn't find shit. And Do you think and, it was the lady in blue? I don't know who it was, but the only thing I seen was the the, the lantern or candlelight of of uh of a glowing coming down the steps. And uh and beat it all, we had a camera down there at the bottom of the steps, but somebody had bumped it and had moved it. It accidentally had moved to the right where you couldn't even see up the steps. Are you god, serious? Was, I'm serious. Oh my god! I was like, "Holy fuck!" Ain't nobody gonna believe me. <laughs> yeah, see, I've never actually captured anything on film that's happened there, other than that first time we were there, and some of my friends came, and uh, the baby dolls in the swing started swinging, and that's when I was like, "Oh no, I I can't stay here no more." <laughs> <laughs> And we did catch that on film, but all the other stuff I've seen there, like we've seen doors open and close. And when I was there with Holly and Misty, the there was a tablecloth that flew off the table, and you know the little piano upstairs plays all the time by itself. That that's happened every time I've been there. Yeah, yeah. Have you heard her footsteps walking across the floor upstairs yet? Yeah, I've heard footsteps. I've heard. Um, one of the ladies that was and actually Greg Shook's fiance, uh, we were all sleeping in that big room, what they call the toy room. And that's mm-hmm. the room I'm actually the most afraid of, but something grabbed her leg when we were in there. And yeah. uh and then my boss Tiny came and stayed and saw the tricycle in that room move across the floor. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. a scary place. And there, I don't know if you've seen this picture. They have a picture on their Facebook page where you're supposed to be able to find the lady in blue. And it's taken from the red room, but you can see the window to the room. Um, that was her bedroom, Betsy. I guess Betsy Smith. And uh, and I looked and looked at that picture. I zoomed in, and I couldn't find her, but I found four other faces, and then I finally found her. So there, there's in that one picture from one room, there's five ghosts just in that one picture so it's like how many if there's that many in just one picture how many are actually in this place right well i know we got a really good evp there and it sounded like and it was a full sentence uh robin and well two of the people three of the people that uh, helped me robin brianna and josh were setting up stuff and you can hear like someone with an irish like a really heavy irish accent and it was a female asking a question and when i played it to Rhonda, i said do you know any if whether any irish people lived here and she's like no but holy shit <laughs> wow like, Most people just get like a a word or two but she said you got a whole damn sentence i'm like well would you yeah, what did like it, it say i can't remember what is that what she said i'd have to look it up because where i've been doing this so long Everything wrote, kind of runs Oh, together. yeah, yeah. 
See, we stayed in a in a haunted house here locally in the next town over from me um, last weekend for my daughter's 16th birthday party. She wanted to go to the Nickers with me, but we couldn't travel out of town, so I found this one close to home that just opened for paranormal investigations, and it's called the William Edgar Heyman House. It's built in 1894, mm-hmm. and... Uh, and it's a three-story huge, like, 4,000-square-foot house. And um, so we stayed the night there, and they had all that, like, legitimate ghost hunting tools, you know, that I've mm-hmm. never used before, the EVP and the EMF and all that stuff. And um, and we got a lot of readings off of that, that stuff only on the third floor of that house, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, I've done it so long. It, it does. Everybody kind of just runs together. Except you, when you get those one special spots that you know you do remember pretty good, that you get a little bit yeah. scared. And, you know, I've had a lot of people ask me, "Do you ever get scared?" And I'm like, "No, I've never been scared. I've never. I've ran in. We've ran into some places where I, I would say they're malevolent. I wouldn't say demon or nothing like that. You, you know, maybe uh, would knock over. Uh, I don't know, knock over a." a, a, a a book or something like that, something simple, or scratch. Yeah. Now, I know a few of the girls in my group, but they've always, it seems like, uh, throughout the years, they've been about all of them's had at least a scratch on a leg or scratch on a back or arm. Oh, wow. Well, see, I am scared. I would piss my pants if that happened to me. <laughs> and people are like, oh, ghosts can't hurt you. Oh, yeah, ghosts can, like, scare you and make you fall down the stairs and break your neck, <laughs> which is probably what would happen to me. <laughs> I know we get a lot of EVPs that call my name, you know, like they're trying to get my attention, uh, whether it be male, female, old, young, even kids. And you Oh, know, wow. Are, they're like, does that not bother you? I'm like, no. Wow, it would bother me. See, the first <laughs> night I stayed in the Nickerson Sneed house, I was up till like 3.15, and I had taken a ton off PM, and I, I had to pee really bad, and we were all in the same bed in that in that big room. <clears throat> and so I called my husband at like 3.12, and I was like, you got to talk on the phone with me while I go pee because I'm too scared to go by myself. <clears throat> so I hung up with him at exactly 3.15, and that's when I fell asleep because I felt safe finally. Like, I'd been watching the walls all night and listening to see if I hear, hear anything. And uh, one of my friends called me the next day, and he's like, why didn't you call me in the middle of the night? And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you called me at, like, 3.30 in the morning. I'm like, no, I didn't. I was asleep by 3.15. He said, yeah, you called me, and you were on the phone with me for four minutes, and you were speaking French the whole time. And I'm like, dude, I don't know. Like, I took French in high school, but I don't know French other than, like, bonjour, you know. <laughs> so he told mm-hmm. me, he repeated to me whatever it was I said in French. <clears throat> and he said that he could kind of hear, like, a, a male tone to my voice. And he, he said, well, who, just who is this? And he said whenever he asked that, I growled at him and hung up on him. Oh, and, wow. uh, yeah, I have, like, no, like, I was passed out between the hours of, like, 3.15 and, like, 8 a.m., so I don't know what that was about, but I told Rhonda about it, and she said, you know, where it was a fort during the French and Indian War, that that would make sense, you know, along those lines. But <clears throat> mm-hmm. I don't know. It's hard to say because, it, you know, where they use uh, these spirits, it seems like they're able to use a lot of electricity and and outlets and and battery power and everything. So yes, it, my it, phone it, battery was perfectly fine till the first time I went to that house, and it completely drained my battery. And I've gotten a new battery and replaced it since then. My phone still won't hold a charge ever since the first time I've been there. Yeah, a lot of people have a lot of problems like that uh, electronic uh, equipment. I mean, I've even had equipment malfunction to where it won't work no more. And how to get new equipment. It's like, damn it, don't don't mess up my equipment. That shit cost me money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Well, I didn't I didn't mean to get off topic. I'll get for you people that's wanting to know more a little bit more about moonshine, I'll I'll I'll, I'll get back on straight. Uh but we you, you gotta add the the paranormal to it because I you, you know I, I've heard my grand my grandpa talk about uh, when they was out in the woods and stuff, stuff they seen and heard and couldn't explain. So it goes hand in hand. So anybody want to send me a yeah. few minutes? <laughs> you, 
<laughs> That's why I've had a lot of my moonshiner friends say, we need to make a run of the Nickerson Sneed House. That up is still and make them run a moonshine liquor there. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. I, 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 I'd have to come down and witness and, you know, of course, taste test for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, so what are the code names for Shine? And uh, how and why do these names come to be? The code names? Mm -hmm. You mean like nicknames for it? Nickname, code name, yeah. Yep. Oh, there's a bunch of them. Panther Piss. Um, That's dude. one I ain't heard in a while. Panther Piss. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't really know how those names originated, other than probably just the old school shiners, you know, trying to use words other than moonshine so as not to get in trouble with the revenue men. Yeah. I'm assuming how that. those terms came to being, but. Okay. Well, you know, as I understand it, you know, uh, Run and Shine is how NASCAR got its start. Uh, do you have any family, you know, that may have any ties with NASCAR? Um, not that I know of personally. Um, <clears throat> my grandfather on my mom's side was big in a NASCAR. And matter of fact, he took my grandma on their very first date to the Bristol racetrack. And then I, I have a 1953 Pontiac Jeepton, <clears throat> which is like a straight up gangster Al Capone looking car. And it's, it's a pretty rare car. There weren't that many of them manufactured. And back when they were made, um, most people wanted the Cadillacs. This was kind of like Pontiac's version of the Cadillac. And, uh, and I actually got to drive that car on the Bristol racetrack uh, last year during the spring race weekend, which was awesome. It's a, you know, 66 years old, has the original straight eight engine, uh, dual exhaust flamethrowers and, and she didn't get on the track and, and I didn't know the history of Pontiac with uh, NASCAR or the Bristol racetrack specifically. But when I first pulled my car onto the track, everyone was like cheering and jumping up and down and yelling Pontiac and, so when I got back home from that trip, I researched it and come to find out um, a Pontiac was the first car ever on the Bristol racetrack. And it was the first car that won the very first uh, Bristol race, which was the Volunteer 500. So I guess Pontiac yeah. has quite the history with the, you know, NASCAR, the, specifically the Bristol racetrack, which um, people probably don't know this, but where the distillery is, East Tennessee Distillery in Piney Flats, Tennessee, was actually supposed to be the site of the racetrack, but the the town of Piney Flats didn't agree to it, so they ended up moving it to Bristol. But I bet Piney Flats is hating that right now. Yeah, yeah, but no doubt. Well, I'm kind of glad he did. It makes it easier for me to go to a race. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because I only live like uh, an hour from Bristol, so it makes it a lot easier. Well, yeah, you're has, in Tasma, right? Yeah. See, I actually, I started, I quit taking the interstate a while back. You know, I travel to the distillery for work quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I normally would take 81 from 77. And uh, the, the truckers have just gotten so bad on the road these past couple of years. I don't know what is going on with the trucking industry, but I started taking the trail of Lonesome Pine there, skirting along the East River Mountains. So I go right through Tasswell, uh, oh, coming to and that. back from Bristol. Yeah, you you drive right probably right there to holler, leads up in here to my house, and yeah, drive, yeah, it's actually it's a it takes a little bit longer. It adds about twenty minutes on the trip, but it's just a much more relaxing drive. You don't have as many cops and no truckers on that road. It's just an easy going ride. So, and actually, I have a friend, um, Whitney Rife. Her last name's Becker. Now she's gotten married, but she's from Tasmania. Well, she has the uh, retail therapist boutique downtown there. Yeah, I know her. You, wow. Uh, her dad is a banker out here. He's, uh, I guess, a manager, Monty. Oh, yeah. Monty yeah. 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 Wow. Well, I'd be damned. <laughs> I yeah, I, bet, I see. I've, I've never actually been to her boutique. I bought from her online store. But uh, I, every time I go through there, I'm like, oh, I want to go to Whitney's Boutique, but it's always like during hours when it's probably not open or she might not be there. But I do need to stop one time and, and come downtown and see her shop there. Well, Abby, I'm sure she'd love that. 
Yeah, she's a sweetheart, isn't she? Yeah, the whole family, they they good people. They really are. That's the one thing about this community. They Everybody's pretty tight-knit around here. And uh, uh, granted, especially, I don't mean to get into politics, but, you know, everybody's got their politics around here, and then you have Rodney's, and I, I don't, they don't agree with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm the black I try to stay out of politics. Earth. I just pretend like it doesn't exist. <laughs> Well, boy, these people right here love their politics, as I do too, but I got to kind of keep my mouth shut because I always end up making somebody mad. <laughs> <laughs> but like I told them, if, you know, if everybody was the same, the world would be boring. Yeah, no doubt. Well, well, well has anyone in, in your family or any of your friends, you know, have they, other than yourself, been caught or or went to jail for making shine? No, I do know that um, my great-great-grandfather that made liquor shot at a revenue man one time. Uh, my grandpa was there, and he was a little boy helping carry supplies in and, <clears throat> and witnessed that. But um, And I don't know if my other great-grandfather ever found out that that was his wife that shot up the store or if he thought it was a revenue man. Oh, uh, but as far as I know, none of them have actually ever ended up in the big house for it. Well, that's good. But, you know, West Virginia, it's kind of like the Wild West here. And uh, the law more or less leaves you alone unless you're doing harm to someone else around here, you know. And mm-hmm. actually, a lot of West Virginia lawmen make it themselves, so. I have had people that know that I do it that have actually tried to get me in trouble with the law, but <clears throat> I, I have not actually officially been in trouble <laughs> up to this point, thankfully, because I don't want to go to prison. And, you know, to me, being an outlaw isn't about being a criminal. It's more or less living by your own guidelines instead of falling into what society, you know, wants everyone to be like robots. And to me, being an outlaw is just stepping outside those lines and doing things your own way so it's it's not ever been a goal of mine to end up with a mugshot or in prison you know I've got kids to take care of and farm to take care of and all that so well you know I, 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 as far as being an outlaw or anything I'm, it's been about five years ago I was getting ready to go out and mow and I seen a helicopter come right over top of our mountain real slow. And I'm and real low. I'm like, what the hell is he doing? And there's back up here behind my house up on the hill, there's a family cemetery. I seen him hovering and then he landed. And I'm like, what the fuck is he doing up there? And no sooner did I started to, you know, get on my mountain, I was going right up there and see what the hell they're doing. <laughs> there's a Four black SUVs that pulled up and behind my house is the road that leads up through there. And it was a, a, a I guess, the undercover officer. He slapped a big badge in front of me and he said, Open the gate. I'm like, oh, There you go. Have a good time. Oh, shit. They and, done brought the SWAT team after you. Yeah. It wasn't after me. It was, it was after uh, like $40,000 worth of pot that somebody is oh. Oh, wow. growing up there. <laughs> Because when it came back down, I seen all this pot in the back of their uh, SUVs, and I was like, "Wow!" And then finally, at one, he stopped to talk to me, want to know who's been up there and all this shit, and and I, I told him, "You know, I I don't know who's been up there, but if I knew all that was up there, you wouldn't be getting it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've actually had them bust uh, pot growing close to my farm before too, with those infrared helicopters that fly over. But yeah. that's been several years ago. <clears throat> Boy, Virginia has a heart on busting anybody for anything. Good God. That's <laughs> a, that, that, that's a, and it's my cousin's property, and I asked him, I said, you know about it? He's like, I didn't know shit. I'm like, right. Yeah, see, Virginia, the law will get you in Virginia. They'll get you every time. I, I lived in Virginia uh, in Quantico for a couple years on the Marine Corps base, and then I lived in Front Royal for about five years. And, uh yeah, no doubt they will get you there every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they do love busting the bad guys. Well, I was. Which I kind of I give the lawmen a hard time because, 
you know, they probably get sick of their regular everyday job of people saying, yes, sir, no, sir, I won't do it again. So I just, I tell on myself every time, like for stuff they would never, you know, like the time I told on myself for the moonshine when I was bootlegging, I was speeding that day and I was doing like 80 through a work zone. It was supposed to be a 55 mile an hour and it's an undercover cop. And, and not only was I speeding through a work zone, but I also had expired registration, expired inspection sticker. And I didn't have my insurance card with me. So he should have hauled my ass off of jail. And mm. uh, he pulled me over. And <clears throat> when he asked for my license, he looked at me and he said, well, why were you speeding, Miss Sparks? And I said, well, because I like to drive fast and you're slowing me down. You know, I'm almost home <laughs> right there's my road. <laughs> and he just kind of looked at me funny. And I said, and I'm also an outlaw. And he's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I, I do some bad shit. And he said, no, what What do you do? It's against law. I said, I'm not telling you you're the lawman man and uh he said he started laughing he said no it's okay and i had my phone sitting on my lap and uh one of johnny cash's best friends is one of my best friends chance martin he does the radio show on series like some outlaw country under alamo jones and it was his birthday that day and his picture with johnny cash popped up on my phone and the officer said you need to get that and i was like no that's just johnny cash's best friend i'll call him back later so he's looking at me like who the hell are you and uh he said, now tell me what you do that's against the law. And I said, well, I, I run liquor. And he said, well, you don't have any in this vehicle, do you? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, yeah, I've got some in the trunk. He's like, no. I said, yeah, let me out of here and I'll open it and show you. So he let me out of my door and we went around to the trunk and I opened it and showed him what I had back there. And I said, now the only reason I haul this around is, you know, if I run out of gas, I'm going to put some in my gas tank and get down the road. And he said, well, that's not strong enough to run a gas tank. And I said, well, bullshit. Take you a swig of it and see. <laughs> and he just stood there shaking his head, and we talked for about 20 minutes, and he told me to have a nice day, no warning, nothing. <laughs> oh, wow. Because I threw him off guard. He didn't know what to do with me after that. You know, he's just like, who is this crazy bitch? And I should have never pulled her over, so just, you know, go on about your day. <laughs> Damn. Damn. I, I ain't never that lucky. I'll I, I tell you how bad. I, tell you, I used to drive a track trail across country in California every week. And down there in Tennessee, on the other side of Knoxville, uh, on 40, I was doing 85 that night, got pulled over for speeding. Now, on the way back, same mountain, going up the other side, I got beside another truck and ended up, we both were going so damn slow, impeded traffic, and I seen the damn a Tennessee trooper. He's probably a good half a mile behind me with his lights on, pointing at me. As soon as I got to the top no. of the mountain, I pulled over and waited on him. He came up. He's like, what the? And it was the same damn cop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. He, he gave me a ticket for speeding and another one for going too slow up the same damn mountain two days Oh, later. shit. What's the <laughs> chances of that? That's probably never happened before. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, I said, it's been an honor to work for the state of Tennessee this week, sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. He's like, yeah, well, the people of Tennessee appreciate your work too, and I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> well, my thing lately, when I see a law man, man, I tell them I'm the zipper police, and they immediately check their fly. I, I get them every time. They check it every time. <laughs> oh my God. I worked at a bank for about a year uh, before I did the Appalachian Outlaws TV show, <clears throat> and. uh you know, the cops would come through there, and I'd, I'd get on the intercom and tell them, don't come back here unless you bring us some damn donuts, you know, and all the little bank ladies are like, no, shut up, you can't say donuts to cops. I'm like, well, <laughs> they need to bring some damn donuts and send them through this machine, you know, <laughs> and then I would tell them, you know, hey, I'm going to rob the vault today. I need a, a police escort down to Mexico. I mean, the, the <laughs> people that work there and the people in the lobby would just die every time I would say something like that. I'm like, you got to lighten up their day, you know. Well, that's like me. One time I went through a bank, uh, through the bank teller uh, drive through and uh, I, I had a friend with me, and I wrote on a piece of paper. I said, I, help me. She's holding me hostage. And they sat there <laughs> and they looked at it, and they looked at her, and she was just smiling and waving. And I was, you know, looking like all petrified and shit over the sign. And they were like, are you okay, Rodney? <laughs> Help. And oh, you can have some fun in a bank. <laughs> you damn right you can. 
<laughs> I would I'd catch bugs outside when I I'd put spiders and shit in that little tube that you send to them. <laughs> and I, I threatened to rob that bank every day that I worked there, which, of course, I never did, but they never fired me ever threatening it either, so. Damn. Yeah, I had some fun there. Damn, man, you can shoot shit and just talk about anything. I'm getting off topic again. I'm sorry, everybody. Oh, that's all right. All right. That's all right. That's right. That's, that's just country people talking, shooting shit. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain to everyone what it means, the proof of the shine, uh, and um, why is the proof of the shine so important in making the product? Well, you want different proofs on different liquor. Like my honeysuckle that I do, I always proof it tempered down to 80 just because it tastes the best. That picks up the most of the floral essence of that flavor. Um, the clear liquor, I typically like right about 100 proof. I I can drink higher than that, and matter of fact, my boss, Tiny, makes 150 proof clear liquor, and it's just as smooth as any low proof liquor you can find. It's, it goes down real easy, but I'm kind of a cheap date, so like literally one sip of that 150 proof, and I'm drunk. Um, <clears throat> but it all just depends on, you know, a lot of what, what you're making with it, whether you're making brandy or straight corn liquor or you're doing flavors. Um and most people probably, I'd say most women probably like the lower proofs, around 80 or so. But my favorite with the clear liquor is right at 100. My my legal untamed is the 80 proof, though. Mm-hmm. But it's just a smooth uh, coming off the pipe at 185 as it is at the 80 proof. Well, what do you use to proof it down, then? Distilled water. Well, what about uh, where a lot of flavors are being added now? Different fruits and and and, and uh, spices and stuff. Uh, what's your What's your opinion about those? Um, I use a Tennessee Thumper still. As a matter of fact, Tennessee Thumper stills is my only official sponsor, and that's Rick Gibson. He makes he designs and builds those. Um, and he's part of the Mason Jar Mafia group that I'm in. Uh, Chris Kelly. With Rocky Point Copper Stills is also, he's like the boss man of that whole group. Um, but with the Tennessee Thumper Stills, uh, the way they're designed, you can actually infuse flavors rather than doing like a brandy or uh, <clears throat> you can, and you can actually shut it off mid run and change the flavors in the Thumper Stills and the Thumpers. Um, so I could do like honeysuckle for part of the run and then take the jars off and do something else, you know. Mm-hmm. But his well, rigs are the best as far, as far as for infusing flavors. They they do an awesome job. Okay. Yeah. When well, when I first started making the honeysuckle, I actually used the the honeysuckle flowers, and in the mash, you know, they have such a short life season. You know, it's like not even a month that they're in bloom, <clears throat> and with that being in demand year round, I ended up going. And switching to an extract, which is what I use now, and the infuser still that I have, the Tennessee Thumper still. Okay. Well, which produces a better product, copper or steel, or uh, or stainless steel? Um, you should always have at least some copper in your rig uh, to get the impurities out. But my, mine is a combination. Uh, the Thumper rig itself is all copper, but then I use a stainless steel keg pot to cook in but do you grow your own uh uh product or do you purchase it uh uh for your uh for your uh moonshine corn and stuff Mm -hmm. no i i actually um i'm getting into growing bloody butcher corn which i just got my first uh shipment of that from dancing star uh farm scene and that is actually a strain of corn that was originated by my ancestors. My great 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 grandmother was Potawatomi Indian, and that's where that <clears throat> strain of corn came from. She originated that corn, and so I've wanted to use that to make liquor for a long time. And I finally just got my first shipment of it from the nursery in Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm actually going to order some seed stock from him of the Bloody Butcher corn to 
to try to grow on the farm, I'm going to start with about three acres. But honestly, I have never had luck growing corn on my farm, and I've tried it in different locations and different methods of it. <laughs> and, you know, the, the deer population here is pretty big. So, <clears throat> and with me traveling as much as I do, I'm not here to babysit and do as much gardening as we used to do here, but I am going to try to grow that and see how it does. Well, if you do, you're going to probably have to get you some kind of fencing to go around it. Uh, yeah. For that deer fencing, cause, uh, I, I put out a garden about every year, you know, ever since I was old enough to hold a hoe. And here in Tazewell, I, I don't know if you've noticed, deer's got terrible here too. I actually had to act, uh, past couple years had to put damn deer fence around my damn garden to keep them out of it. Yeah, see, I'm gonna end up having to do the same thing. I do have one place uh, down here closer to my house that I can keep a closer eye on, and then I have seven dogs that keep them run off from right here. But the other places on the farm that would be better for growing crops um, are out of sight, so I definitely would have to do something mm -hmm. in those places to keep the deer out. Yeah, I don't. I think they need to make the season a little longer. My gosh. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, which is your best seller of, of of the product that you sell? That I make at home or the legal? Uh, either or well, both. Yeah, let's just go both. Um, the Outlaw Spirits Untamed is doing pretty good. Uh. I'd like to see it do better, but it's it's just one of those things where it's going to take more time, and <clears throat> I need to get it more established as a brand because it's such a new brand. Um, but me and Shane have been working on that, and hopefully that'll be in bigger circulation here soon. But um, yeah, it's the the prices in West Virginia as far as making the black market liquor are definitely better than they are say down in Tennessee because in Tennessee you have so many people pretty much everyone down there makes it so the most you can fetch for a quart down there is about $20 a, a jar where in West Virginia most of the people that make it here are making it for self-consumption instead of distribution so you can actually mark it up higher here about mm. 30 I've even sold it for $40 a quart in West Virginia oh, that's good well um friend of mine asked me this uh, and wanted me to ask you, uh, does shine need to be refrigerated and can it, uh, uh, how long does the shelf life uh, last on uh, some shine? No, it doesn't have to be refrigerated. I actually prefer it room temperature. Most people like it better chilled. I always drink mine room temperature, but it, as far as the shelf life of it, it'll last forever. It doesn't go bad, so... Okay. You can find a 50-year-old jar of liquor in your grandpa's barn and drink it, <laughs> as long as it's made right. <laughs> well, I wish I'd run into some of my pawpaws. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I've been running around the basement bouncing off the walls. Yeah. Oh, why is it important to throw away the first amount of shine being pr produced, and, and how much of it do you throw away? Um, that's why it has the methanol in it, so it can actually cause you to be blind or <clears throat> cause botulism, so you have to throw that out just to make sure that no one gets sick, you know, and, and not everyone does that. If you do make your own liquor, you should definitely always throw out the heads because that can be very harmful to people that drink it. Okay. Are and it depends any... on how big of a run you're making, how much you need to throw out. Oh, okay. Are there any other uses uh, for uh, shine other than drinking it? Uh, yeah, it's been used for medicinal purposes for a long time. As a matter of fact, uh, going back to the ginseng industry, a lot of my friends that are ginsengers will actually put the roots in a jar of shine and let it sit there, make a tincture out of it, or even mix it with honey and other things and uh, drink that when they're sick. Yeah, my grandma used to make up, uh, make it. Man, I, I couldn't. All, I, in the wintertime, I always couldn't wait to get sick to go to my mom's. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, my mom. Uh, oh, my mom. 
poor mama. <laughs> Just kind of pretend like you got a cough there. <laughs> yeah, I would. She'd always, she'd get in the, in, the, in the damnedest place she'd keep it. You know, you'd think mama also would put it up high where no kid could get it. No. She kept it right under the sink. She could come up with Probably it. Probably they think kids don't like the taste of it. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, well, this no, is I was just telling my cousin yet. today, uh, her little baby is teething, and I said, you need to get a rag and put some moonshine liquor on that rag and let her chew on that, and that'll help the pain of her teething and help her sleep a little bit. Yep. And she said, you know, I've heard that before, and I'm like, yeah, that's what all the old timers did that. There's nothing wrong with that. And when, like I said, when my kids are sick, I make them take a shot of whiskey. <clears throat> yeah, I did mine too. I think that's the reason why I turned one of my boys into a drunk, but uh, it's all right. No, no. He got out of, he got out yeah. of it. I his ass. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I actually do have a, my family history has some alcoholism along the lines there, and it skipped me because I've never been one of those that has to have a drink. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I, I really don't drink at home at all unless I'm just tasting what I make. Um, <clears throat> I, I pretty much just drink socially, but but, you know, further generations of my family have actually been alcoholics and died from alcoholism. So it's something that I preach to my kids, you know, always in moderation, you know, when you get old enough to drink, don't ever, yeah, ever had, do it, you know. Yeah, I had to do it to mine because <clears throat> my dad was an alcoholic. Some people say I was. I, I, I say I wasn't, but. They said, did you get up drinking? I'm like, yeah. Did you go to bed drinking? I'm like, yeah. You're the alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Oops, I guess I was. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, some people, they do. They take it too far. And it's, it, and I think it's in the genes. You get, it, It's just, you know, Robert does. Some people, when they get the taste, they just they constantly chasing it. Yeah, yeah, it definitely can be genetic and hereditary, but like I said, that that skipped me. I and you know, like I said before, the whole moonshine industry to me is not necessarily about alcohol as much as as it is about a way of life and a tradition of mountain people. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not oh. just drinking to get drunk. You're drinking someone's hard work that they put in that jar, and you're drinking someone's family history that they put in that jar. You know, it's, it's, it means more to me than just an alcoholic drink. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, what is the purpose of placing shine in a mason jar or a gallon jug? Is it just a transport, or is it just another symbolic way, or just a, a part of the heritage? I've never really thought about it that much. Honestly, I think it's just, it's always been done like that, mason jars, you know. And mason jars are sturdy. Like, I've canned and made lots of liquor and hauled lots of liquor in mason jars, and I've never, ever seen a mason jar break, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, they're made pretty well. Well, you know, I've, I've also heard that, you know, back in the day that uh, the mason jars with the number 13 on them, they, they would destroy them or uh, bury them. Uh, yeah, have you heard yeah, this? they're very hard to find. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, moonshiners would come across there. They they'd break them or throw them away because it was, was considered bad luck. Oh, okay, that's what I was going to say. Was and it? I've actually run across some of them at like uh, flea markets and and yard sales and antique stores and stuff. And they they go for a high dollar if you do find one because they're so rare. There's not many of them around. You know that 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 be true too, because I haven't I haven't seen any either. Um, let's see. Well, here's a something I've often wondered, and uh, uh, you know how when you're when you're canning and especially garden stuff uh, or anything else, and you give it to a family member or something like that, and they return your jars. You know, do do like people that you know, friends of yours or family that, you know, might buy some off of you and then bring you back the jars or. No, I never see the jars that. again. I never see the jars again. My grandma was big at canning. She canned everything. She always grew a big garden. She always insisted if she gave you a jar of food, bring the jars back, you know. 
So people always return them to her, but I've never asked that anyone return them to me, and I've never had anyone give one back. So you just okay. assume once they're out of your hand, you, that's the end of that jar. You'll never see it again. <laughs> what my what my mom always used to always tell me about, uh, you know, I always love, love their food, or especially canned food. She's like, boy, you know the reason why that food tastes so good? Why? She said, that's an old liquor jar right there. All that came from. Mm-mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Them green beans taste, huh? That's it. Them green beans taste good with that little shine on it, don't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you can't get any better than home canned food, can you? There are not well, many people that, that even can anymore, but that's something. I haven't kept a garden for the last couple of years where I travel so much, but. I did. Uh, I've got some heritage heirloom green bean stock that's been in my family for hundreds of years, and uh, we planted a big patch of that last year. And I think I canned 40 quarts of it, and we ate every bit of that within like two months. It was gone. Wow. Green beans with every meal. <laughs> but you just, oh, you yeah. know, it takes you back in time if you've been raised like that by your grandparents. You know, had that good homemade canned food that came straight from their dirt in their backyard. You know, or on their farm. That that to me, when I open a can of that and and cook it and eat it, it takes me back in time to my grandma's house, and, you know, in her kitchen and her serving that on her table. So, see, yeah. that, and that's what I uh, when my kids when when I was raising them, I was, I'd have them out in the garden with me, and of course they'd bitch and complain and moan and groan. And, oh and yeah. I, told them, I said I never did it to my grandma or my grandpa. No, 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 no. They, I don't give a shit if the sun's just coming up. You got your ass out there and you helped them. And, 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 yeah. And I'm like, what is it with y'all? I said, this is a Yeah, dime. you were said, expected to home back then. See, my kids have been raised on a farm and they do the same thing. They can't stand working in the garden. They hate it. But they, yeah. they will get out there and help, but they're not happy about it, you know. Oh, mine were never happy about it. Now, mine are in their 20s and now they're like, Daddy, I want to put out a garden. I'm like, well, did you learn anything? <laughs> I should have no. been paying attention back in the day. <laughs> That's it. No, can you help me? Yeah, I can I can help you, but you know, I'm gonna stand there and tell you what to do. You're gonna do all the work. Yeah. And they're like, Well, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, but you know, if you've gotten used to eating that home grown food, you can't hardly anything from the grocery store because it's not anywhere near the same. No, it's not. It's not. No. They've no, gotten I, spoiled on that good food. Now they want it for themselves. <laughs> that's exactly. See, my son was here today, and he was talking to me about putting out a garden, and, and could I help him and all that? And I'm like, yeah, I'll help you. And I said, but do, you see your kids right there? You're going to teach them, too. I said, that's part there of you your go. heritage, boy. I said, if the world goes all the fuck, you're going to have to know how to do this. I've been preaching this to you ever since you was that little. I yeah, know. but, you know, most modern-day households, uh, kids aren't taught the old ways anymore. And, and it was it was a generation of my grandparents, which were raised during the Great Depression. I don't know when your grandparents were around, but <clears throat> that generation was the last true hardworking generation. And they were the last of the true storytellers that passed things down. So if any generation after them didn't get it, they're never going to get it. You know, it's like... That that's one reason why I've been insistent on raising my kids on a farm and teaching them how to harvest their own food and and you know hunt and fish and all these things that you need to know to be self sufficient. You know that most kids nowadays have no clue. They have no damn clue of any yeah. of this. But you know it has been kind of a mission of mine to like at least try to teach that to my kids whether they use it and pass it down or not that's up to them but at least I've done my part in trying to pass it down from what I learned from my grandparents you know yeah I agree and my my grandparents were raised during the great depression era too and I mean they kept everything and they used everything they had yeah yeah that's what I could never figure out but my dad and uh, my uncles (coughs) they only had like a Sixth grade education, but man, they could tear a motor apart. And I'm sitting there looking at a book, going, "How do y'all doing it?" <laughs> what the? Fuck? Oh yeah, I've known some old timers that couldn't even read a word out of a book, but they know more than most people around them. You know, they're smart. They've learned yeah. other ways. You know. Yeah. 
Well, let me see here. What was the next question? Oh, uh, well, I think you already answered that. We just talked about the pricing. Uh, uh, well, are you already answered that one? Oh gosh, I ain't paying no attention. I'm, <laughs> I'm so, I keep me a list of questions so I can keep up and make sure I know what the hell I'm asking. I'm and, glad you're keeping up because I can't keep up. I'm I'm trying to drink some coffee. This is past my bedtime, but I did. I took a nap this afternoon to compensate for my beauty sleep that I have to have at night because I'm an old lady. But I went to make a pot of coffee right before I called you. I was out of coffee, but I had some of those. Keurig pots that I bought on accident because I don't have one of them Keurig pots. And so I uh-huh. tore one of them open and boiled some water and, and made do with whatever kind of cowboy coffee I, I turned that into. But <laughs> it's keeping me awake, but I'm glad you're keeping track of what we're supposed to be talking about because it's hard to tell what all <laughs> subjects I would get into. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up, but we where we just keep you know, mo- most time when I, I do interviews with people, you know, I have a list of questions, and then normally uh, when they answer, I'm always going down through here checking and checking and checking if they uh, answer something that I, I had on the list to ask. And and me and you, we've just been sitting here talking so damn, just like, like hell, I've known you all my life or something. I ain't yeah. paying bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. I was actually nervous about this one because I'm – the longest interviews I've ever done have been one hour, and I've only ever interviewed with uh, the Blast Zone Mike show, Mike Wilkerson from Kentucky, uh-huh. and uh, and he doesn't really have a specific list he goes off of. He just kind of shoots from the hip, so I never know what he's going to ask, and I never know what I'm going to say because I have, like, zero filter, and I'm always <laughs> afraid, like, to go back and listen. Oh, shit, what did it, like, did I incriminate myself? What did I say? <laughs> And I have actually said shit that I shouldn't say on interviews before, so I'm I'm trying not to do that tonight, but it's probably already too late. <laughs> uh, that's one thing good about my show. I, I you know, I, I you know, I there's one guy I kept saying I, I kept cussing. And about halfway through the show, the guy said, Can I cuss too? I said, well, fuck <laughs> him. He's like Oh fuck, that feels so fucking good. <laughs> yeah, see that that's why that was one of my first questions to you, like if you have a bleep monitor, because it's gonna be going off the whole time if you're talking when you're talking to me. <laughs> oh gosh! But the reason why I, I, I type up some questions is that way uh, it, 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 it keeps me on track because I do. I, I have a way of wandering. I don't know if you uh, already can tell that by now, but I do. I have a way of wandering off a show and. And then, you know, sometimes I'll get a message from somebody or some people going, man, I was really interested in what the stories y'all was telling, but can you ask them this question? I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to tell <laughs> Well, hey, that's the good thing about your show versus the one I normally do because it's uh, video for one thing. So, you know, at least with this one, I don't have to look, you know, all fixed up and shit. Like I'm sitting here in my pink striped pajama pants and a white bathrobe and a West Virginia toboggan. Uh, <laughs> so at least I don't have to look presentable. And I was really happy about that. And me and Teresa were talking about, cause I guess their her interviews coming up in May, right. From the yeah. Moonshiner show, Teresa. And mm-hmm. I was like, at least you don't have to like be on video so we can like have no makeup on and have our hair a mess and look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> That reminds me, there's a guy I've had on the show a couple of times. His name is Alan Wright. Uh, he's a, a paranormal author. And uh, first time I interviewed him, you know, it, it, it was funny. He's like, hey, Rod, how you doing? I mean, that's just just right out of the get-go. I said, I'm doing good. I'm sitting here in my phone, bikini underwear, and my beard. <laughs> and, I'm right and he busted. <laughs> I can hear his wife in the background. <laughs> <laughs> he's like well that's good because i'm sitting here in my tidy whitey's drinking me a bottle of wine <laughs> <laughs> there you go see that's a good thing about doing the podcast versus the video interview because that makes me more nervous when people can see me too and hear me <laughs> it's like oh god i gotta look you know presentable and act presentable and <laughs> it's much easier like this but i did I asked my husband before I started, I was kind of nervous before I called you. I'm like, what if I have to pee? Because it's like two hours long. I'm drinking all this coffee. <laughs> He's 
like, just put it on mute for a minute. It'll be fine. <laughs> That's right. I know other people have done that. <laughs> I told my dad here, she did that. It was a long mute. And I'm like, hello? Hello? <laughs> hello? And all of a sudden, she's like, oh, Or what I'm, if I'm you thought you pushed mute and you didn't really push it? That would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> Has that ever I happened on your show? I asked her, I said, did, did, did you just take a piss? She's like, I had to. It was, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, no. <laughs> I busted out. Like, I said, that is awesome. <laughs> you got to go when you got to go. But where, right. I'm, where I travel so much, when I'm on the road, I don't stop for anything. I don't stop to pee. I don't stop to eat. I only stop if I'm, like, running on fumes, like, literally no gas. <clears throat> so I, I can hold it for, like, up to eight hours when I'm on the road. Dang. So I, should, I should be okay. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, I know when I used to run, uh, I, I'd have to stop. I didn't stop a lot. That's what a lot of the co drivers and people I train, they'd get, when I got in that truck in, in North Carolina, I wanted to get back, at, go to California, get unloaded, get loaded, and get back. I didn't yeah, like you're doing a real long haul trucking. Yep, and I didn't like the stopping and casinos and all that shit. I want to do my job and get back home. But see, no, my son's always... wanting to go on a long haul truck driving, and he does want to stop and sightsee. But see, nowadays, and tell me if I'm right, but don't don't the trucks have on the truckers nowadays have GPS on their rigs, right? Oh, so yeah, your company's yeah. like watching where you are. Yep. Yep. So you can't stop and bullshit and sightsee and do all that anymore, can you? Well, it, it, it depends um, on, the, one, the company you work for. Uh, the company I work for, or companies I work for, um, uh, Mount Airy, they, uh, you know, they were real you know, they lenient on that. Uh, as long as you got uh, unloaded and loaded on time and, and got back on time, you know, they really didn't have a big deal about it. But today they really got strict guidelines about, you know, to get to point A and B and you better get there unless you have a breakdown or something, get loaded, unloaded, whatever, and then get your ass back. They, 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 they don't like for people to go out there and play around. But these Do you think that's why truck down. drivers have gotten so bad lately? Cause I've noticed that more probably been in the past five years, but especially the past two years, I've noticed the truck industry going so far downhill that I can't even seem to be on the road anymore. And I, I've always had a high respect for that trade, you know. And well, <clears throat> I, I think it's because a lot of old timers like me that used to drive, uh, uh, where we all got medical conditions, and they they've uh, the government has uh, took away, you know, made all these restrictions. That, you know, if you got, uh, say, I got diabetes and neuropathy. Well, I, I can't drive a truck because of that. Uh, yeah. So they took my license, and, you know, there's other men and women out there that have it, you know, as they've aged, they're having all kinds of medical problems, and they're taking their license. And these young men and women that's coming out there, they don't respect the fucking road. They don't respect the people. They just don't respect no. what they do. They just don't give a shit. Oh, it's gotten bad. If if my grandpa was alive nowadays, he was a pilot, but he drove on the road like he was flying a plane. But truckers back then knew how to drive, and you knew you could trust them when you were going by them or when they were passing you. You trusted what they were doing. But nowadays, I've seen more swerving, trucks going off of bridges, trucks going off of cliffs, trucks turning over, uh, trucks catching on fire. I've seen so much of that in the last couple of years. I just I'm like, and I've talked to several of my truck driving friends, like, what the hell is going on? And one of them said that they're putting all these safety features on the rigs now that are actually doing more harm than good as far as all these alerts that go off if you're, you know, cross over your line or um, speed controls when you're pass trying to pass a vehicle. They won't let you go over the speed uh, faster than the vehicle besides you. Do you think that's part of the problem, too? Yeah, I, I think that's a lot of it, and I also think people having a cell phone in their hands a problem. Yes, and using the GPSs and all that, right? Yep. Well, yeah, because a lot of trucks already have the GPS in them. So uh, back in my day when I was driving a truck, you know, we used a map or we used a telephone and call and got directions. Yeah. But, you know, we, we didn't have. I, I, I didn't have. We didn't have cell phones. I mean, they were just coming out. 
for a lot of truckers, right. but hell, I they couldn't They were like the size one. of a brick back then, too, yeah? Yeah. And, you, know, <laughs> you couldn't talk on one while you're driving down the road because you had to, like, two-hand those sons of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. I know when, uh, you know, like, when I drove, I call home. When I got to Lake Havasu City, that's when I went out, that's when I call home. Let them know I was going, get ready to go into California and what's going on at home. And then when I go into California, get unloaded and get loaded back, when I got to Lake Havasu City again, I call home and say, I'll be home in a couple of days. And that's how that's how it worked for me. Right. Just check in every so often when you can, yeah. Yeah, but I've, I've seen drivers out there, even back in back then, they, man, they couldn't get, couldn't let go of that phone and couldn't get out in casino. I tell you what, I was training this guy one time. We got to Oklahoma City. And it was dark, and that's all he talked about was getting him a lot lizard. I, I said, you ain't getting no lot lizard in my fucking truck. <laughs> well, I stopped in, filled up, and went in to pay, and everything, get me something to eat. I went back, that truck was a rock, and I slung open that door, and he's like, can you give oh, me that five more minutes? I said, get, <laughs> get the fuck out, both of you. Get out, my you nasty-ass people. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, I could, I could sit and tell you stories that make you cry, make you laugh. They contaminated and, your rig. Yeah. And I couldn't <laughs> even sleep there. I, I was like, uh oh. Oh, shit. Uh, see, I yeah. used to, uh, when I traveled on, I used to travel even more than I do now. I used to go to Nashville quite a bit. I've got a lot of friends in Nashville. And <clears throat> uh, Johnny Cash's brother, Tommy, actually taught my grandpa how to play the guitar when they were stationed in the army and germany together back in the 50s late 50s and uh so i started going to nashville and i i met tommy there at the johnny cash museum downtown and uh and then i i become good friends with one of johnny's best friends i was telling you about earlier chance martin <clears throat> and he was uh johnny's stage manager for, manager for about 30 years and during the johnny cash show and on his world tours and everything so i became friends with all these people in nashville <clears throat> and uh started going there about once a month and it's a it's a seven hour drive for me from here and so i would a lot of times sleep in my car at the truck stops i like the sound of the diesel engines running and then you can get up and you know have coffee in a bathroom or whatever <clears throat> and i had actually gotten invited to the grand Ole opry by the owner of the johnny cash museum downtown and i was running late i had to work that day and got off work and hit the road and you know i always travel and like you know, jeans and sweat, you know, sweatpants or whatever, ball cap, my cowboy boots. You know, I don't, I don't travel looking presentable because I'm just gonna get dirty. You know, spill coffee and shit in between here and there. Mm-hmm. So I had to stop at a truck stop. Um, I think it was around Franklin, Kentucky, and and I went in there and asked if I could use their truck stop shower, and they didn't charge me. They let me use it, but I went in there looking like a truck driver, and I came out with all this glittery sequins and sparkles, you know, already for the Grand Ole Opry. <laughs> yeah. And the truck drivers that saw me go in and come back out were looking at me like, what the hell happened to you in there? <laughs> <laughs> but my hair, like all the steam in that truck stop shower room, I was trying to curl my hair and my hair ended up just being a disaster. So every time I see the pictures from that Grand Ole Opry night, I'm like, there's my damn truck stop hair. <laughs> <laughs> damn. Yeah, I, that was one thing I did. I loved, uh, I loved driving a truck. I miss driving a truck, and and I don't know. Did people? They, they, there was a camaraderie with the truck drivers and the bikers and all. At, and seeing back then, you know, I wear my blue jeans, work boots, and tank top, and a cut off blue jean uh, jacket. The sleeves are cut off of. And, you know, I could walk into any biker bar and, hell, they think I'm one of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a brotherhood, huh? Yeah. And there was one guy I was training. We was out in California. And he had his little khakis on, his little uh, polo shirt and shit. And and (laughs) he was talking about he wanted to go somewhere to eat. I'm like, buddy, I know the perfect spot. They got the best damn man. So we pulled in there, and he's like, there's an awful lot of motorcycles here. I said, yeah, we're going to tell him that. <laughs> and uh, we walked in. That place got quiet. I mean, it just shut down. And I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting that response. 
He had like he a like, fish out of water up in there. Yeah, he was like, I wonder why they got so quiet. I said, well, let's look at all of them. Look at me. Now look at you. Now you tell me <laughs> what is wrong with this. <laughs> you, know, you, you brought me in here on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I did. He was he was all pissed about. He bitched about that all the way home. But they didn't, they didn't say anything to him. They just everybody got quiet and looked at him like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> You're in the wrong place. Yeah. That's right. Well, I know one guy said, "Boy, you off of pretty." <laughs> I was like, "Oh no!" Oh <laughs> shit! Don't drop the soap in there. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get fucked. You're gonna get fucked. Better give me. <laughs> I always wanted to see inside the the big rigs with the nice sleeper cabins on them. Do you drive one like that? Uh, I used to. Yeah, uh, I, I've drove Air National, Peterbilt, Freightliners. Um, mm, let's see, what else have I drove? Kenworth. I don't like Peterbilt. Yeah. I, know, I know a lot of people love Peterbilt. I don't like them because I'm a big old boy. And they're made like a box, and I gotta have some fucking room. Yeah, yeah. Damn, I'm driving yeah, five thousand miles, almost room. Oh yeah, you got to. I I looked online to see pictures of the insides of them because every time I drive past one, I just want to know what it looks like on the inside because some of them are like decked out really nice, right? Yeah. Now those are uh, especially those bigger rigs. Um, they're all decked out. That's normally an owner operator because no oh, company's okay. gonna let you put all that shit on there. Mm -mm. So it's like a they, privately owned. Yeah, yeah, and they mostly live. I mean, when they live, they live that. That's their home. Oh, okay. I've seen some that's got bathrooms in it, kitchens, and all kinds of shit. And I'm like, wow. Yeah, they're nice. Well, yeah. They're nice, but damn, <laughs> you talk about bringing work <laughs> home. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's places I couldn't even I couldn't back up uh, couldn't back up shit in there, and I'm like, you got an extra thirty feet of damn truck. How you back up in anywhere? <laughs> I got a I got a dedicated run, boy. Well, yeah. you just special. <laughs> See, if I had one that nice, I'd have a hard time driving. I'd be when I like camped out in the cool section of the cab, you know. Oh yeah, I've seen a hardwood floor. I mean, you, you, it, it looks like these big buses that uh, tour buses that these uh, like country singers and them would take, and you're like, good God! Yeah, I, I just fancy. See, I, 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 I love to drive a truck. I love to go out and back and forth, but you know, as far as actually having my mansion on wheels as I'm going, I I, I just want that. Yeah. Rather separate home from work, home. Huh? Yeah, I, I like coming home. I like the woods. I like the mountains. I, I, I was one thing when I when I did drive a truck. As soon as I hit the Mississippi River crossing in Tennessee, I'm like, I could smell home. Yeah, like, yeah, that's uh, something about the Appalachian Mountains that call you back home too. Mm -hmm. I've lived it all over the place. Here. I lived in California and uh, Florida, seen. Kentucky, Virginia, Georgia, I forget where all, but I, West Virginia is the only place that's ever felt like that to me. As soon as I see my mountains or that West Virginia state sign, I'm like, amen, hallelujah, I'm home. Yeah, it, it does. It feels good. You know, like I said, whether it be for me, whether it be in Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina, West Virginia, and Virginia, those five states where I guess where we're surrounded by them. Yeah. You know, as soon as I hit one of them, I'm like, Ah, I'm I, you know, there, yep. And you know, guys would ride with me and girls, and they'd be like, well, "Why do you always ah? I'm home." I'm like, "Cause I am home, motherfucker." What is your problem? Yeah, as soon as you see your mountains, it's like they they call out to you. That's, yeah, that's how I always feel coming back home. Yeah, that's, and I agree. I feel the same way. It's what my papa used to always say that. The mountains always call you back, no matter how far you go. They will call you back. Yeah. And that's the damn food. Well, when I live down in Florida, we come back to West Virginia. In the summertime, I go to my grandparents' farm up here. And uh, every time we get to that East River Mountain Tunnel, I'm like, yes, I've made it almost there. 
Well, what part of West Virginia? I'm not trying, you know, put it out there, but uh, let's see. How could you tell me where an area close to where you live without telling me where you I'm live? right in the middle of the damn state, like almost completely in the center. I'm about, you know where the New River Gorge is, right? Yeah. I'm about 40 miles north of that. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, Birch well, River. It, it's it's where they sell most of the Appalachian Outlaws with Birch River. That's really the only my local town here is known for. Mm-hmm. It's being on that TV show. But I I live like on the outskirts of town on the farm here. But <clears throat> it's the closest town, and it's no stoplights, one horse town. Got a school and a post office and a general store, and it takes me about 20 minutes to get to the nearest like grocery store town. You know. Wow. The nearest oh, Walmart, which I try not to do. <laughs> <laughs> I try, but it draws you to it for some reason. Yeah, reason. no, I I stay away. I, I send my husband out for groceries. When I'm home on the farm, I don't leave the farm unless I have to for something. Okay. It's usually something for the kids, you know. But if right. it's up to me, my ass stays put right here. <laughs> well, why did they uh, uh, cancel the show uh uh, Appalachian Outlaw, because wasn't that a big uproar about that, from what I remember? Yeah, the, from what I know of it, the reason why it got canceled was A&E got a new vice president, and um, she didn't want any kind of mountain folk, hillbilly type of shows on her network. And so she, um, uh, history had actually given the green light, and they had started signing contracts for season three. And I do know, and I didn't even watch season two, which was the one I was uh, signed for, other than the first episode I saw at the premiere party for season two. But from what I understand, things got kind of unrealistic on season two, I guess. There was, like, helicopters and airplanes and explosions and shit that doesn't really happen when you're gym singing. And, uh, but I do know for season three they were going to get back to, like, real backwoods digging, you know, and make it more about the plant, you know, and educating people about the ginseng industry, but <clears throat> but the the new vice president of A and E pulled the plug on it after history and gave the green light. It's from what I understand. But I do know that the creator of the show, Chris Brewster, um, he's from Bluefield, West Virginia. Uh-huh. And uh from what I understand he's been trying to get it back on TV, but it's been so long now. Gosh, what it, I think it was 2015 when season two aired. So, you know, you're talking about a couple of years have gone by between now and then. So I, I personally don't think it'll ever go back on air, but it still has a really big following. It would be awesome if it did, because there's a lot of people that would like to see it come back. Um, and it had a high viewer rating when it was on. I don't know, but... It's just yeah, one of those things, Hollywood. I know. I know. I really enjoyed it. I know I was – A&E can be a pain in the ass. I mean, I'm going to put it out there. If, if they get mad at me, they get mad at me. Because uh, I uh, shot – they came here and shot three episodes for my ghost story and uh, from investigations that we done. And they only aired two of them. But when they uh, sent us out, we had to go to L.A. to uh, uh, film there in their studios, you know, questioning us and all this. And I made it clear up front before we even went there, I ain't lying and I ain't making up nothing and you're not going to distort anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They was all cool with that. But when they had me in that chair, they, they had me in that chair for like two hours trying to make me say something, you know, things that wasn't true or didn't happen. I finally took the mic off and I said, I'm done. I said, I'm not yeah. lying. I told you all this. And I went outside and, you know, here comes the producer and here comes the director and here, smoke a cigarette, calm down. And I said, you, you know, you all try to make me say something's not true and I'm not going to do it. Just give me my damn money, my gas money. So I go back home. I, I don't give a shit. No, no, no. This yeah. is what we need. This is what we want. And of course, uh, they did do the right thing, but they did a couple things that I didn't agree with. But yeah, you know, at least it wasn't as bad as it was. It was going to be. Well, they can actually take stuff that you said on mic and splice it and turn it into something you never even said. Like they'll turn it into a new sentence that 
you never even said. Like, they'll just take your words and put them together in different ways and stuff. It's uh, Hollywood is tricky business, yes. Yeah, it's very tricky. Actually, after my first experience with Hollywood, I swore I would never sign up for it again. And because uh, I was never one of those that was, like, looking to be on TV. Like, I was never in any place at school as a child or never on stage anywhere, you know, like, I've always pretty much kept to myself, so that wasn't anything ever on my radar. Is oh, I want to be on TV, but the whole thing with the History Channel just fell out of nowhere onto my lap. So I'm like, well, shit, this happened for a reason. I need to follow it and see where it leads, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I am signed with a different production company now, like I said, DNA Films, and there's some projects going on with them that I'm not allowed to talk about. But but this time around, so far, has been uh, easier sailing for me, luckily. This is my first go-around with Hollywood. Well, that's good. Because, see, I know a lot of people in the paranormal world, that's all they talk about. Like, everybody's wanting a show, wanting a show. I didn't want a show. They contacted me and asked me about some of the cases that they had seen on our uh, website. And I gave them the information. They called me back and so forth and, you know, worked out a deal. They wanted me to fly. I hate flying. I said, I'll drive. Uh, I got a big plan. I can hire everybody. Just give me the gas money. And it took them about a week. And they said, okay, we'll send you, overnight you a check. They overnight me a check. And then I had a hard time getting the damn thing to cash. (laughs) Yeah. But at least you stood up and said, hey, I'm not going to do it this way. It's either the way I want to do it or not at all. Because Hollywood's so used to people that just want to be on TV so bad. They'll do anything or say anything, you know just to have their 15 minutes of fame and you know if you want to stay true to yourself you have to stand your ground and 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 speak up and say no I don't I'm not willing to do these things or this is what I insist on doing you know and producers aren't used to dealing with people like that so it's it's hard to get your way you know Mm -hmm. when it comes to the whole tv world as far as what you would like to see happen with the project versus what they envision but Oh, and, and that I agree. was one you of know, my things. Yeah, you know, they come with, they come with you with an idea, and they're coming to you because they're coming to you for a reason. Because you know it's, it's an area that you know or your expertise or so forth. Then don't try to undercut my opinion and my uh, expertise on something you have no fucking idea. You just stand right, with the camera, exactly, and you want a certain way. That's fine, but. Don't try to make it up. You know, if you're gonna to try to make it up, then I, I I don't want a part of it. You know, I I'd rather be real thing or nothing. And a lot of people, yeah, within the paranormal world, they they kind of fuss at me. They're like, well, Rod, you know, you kind of got to give. I'm like, I ain't giving a hint. You know, no, you I, shouldn't. I just, and that's you know one thing that I have a problem with any kind of. Uh, TV series that's filmed in the Appalachians, I think there's a stereotype that Hollywood wants to give to Appalachian people and the culture and to try to kind of put them in an ignorant, I don't know, stereotype. And whenever I see that, that makes me so mad because the people of Appalachian Mountains are some of the smartest, most resourceful people on the planet you know they they've learned to do things to survive because they have no choice but to do those things you know so anytime they try to dumb that down or make it look like they're ignorant people that just it gets me every time and like when I was filming for the Appalachian Outlaws uh, I was partnered with Mike Ross and they wanted me to play this damsel in distress and oh I need you know someone some guy to come to my rescue I'm like y'all if you're going to portray Appalachian women do it in the correct light and the you know for starters they're not going to go asking a man to come save their day. They're going to load their own gun and take matters into their own hands and take care of shit themselves. You know, they, Appalachian yeah. women are resilient. You know, they're, they're self-sufficient. They don't, they don't have to go running for help when shit hits the fan. They know how to handle those things themselves. So if you're going to portray that, do it in the correct light, you know, don't do it as like this whole damsel in distress thing. Yeah, I agree. Well, Tiffany, we're just about out of time. Lord mercy. Yeah, this, this yeah, two well, hours, hours went by fast, didn't it? They sure did. I, and like I said, I appreciate you coming on the show. But uh, uh, one thing I just wanted to mention, uh, we we hold a Phantom Fest. Uh, we just, this will be our second year uh, down here at Lebanon, Virginia. 
on November 2nd. If you want, just if, if, you, if you've got time, stop by and say hi. And, or if you oh, want to yeah, come I'd by love to. Part, if you want to be a part of it or something, you know, uh, let me know and I can have you down as a special guest or something. Or Oh, awesome. Or yeah, I'd love to do that. Or or just when I come through Chaswa, I'd love to stop and shoot the shit with you sometime in person, meet you in person and bring okay, you a bottle cool. or a jar or something. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm through that way all the time. The trail of Lonesome Pine has become my regular route. So. Oh, yeah, true. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm I, I, right I, in your I'll, neighborhood. I'll, I'll send you my number and just give me a call sometime. You might have to leave a message because I have a lot of people that want money to keep calling me or they say they I owe them money and I don't talk to them. You might have yeah. to leave a message. <laughs> Hey, it's me, damn it. <laughs> That's me. I keep I actually keep my ringer turned off at all times, so I don't even know I have a call till I pick my phone up and see it and like, oh shit, I missed another call. <laughs> well my mom fusses at me. She's like, You got a damn cell phone and you never answer it. I'm like, Well it's and I never pack it on me unless I'm like going uh, maybe thirty miles or something out of town or something, then I might take it. And and I told her, I said, It's always damn fake ass phone calls and they they got our ex, you know, our actual area numbers, and I yes, they have started doing that and using cell phone numbers even. Yeah, and and I pick it up, and it's somebody saying, you know, we, we can add something to your credit card. I'm like, I don't even have a credit card. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so damn it, leave me alone, people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hear you. Well, I'll give you my number too. That way, when I uh, when I call you, you'll know it's me. I'll send it to you on Messenger. Oh, okay, okay. Well, before before we jump off here, uh, what are your plans for the rest of two, uh, 2019 that you can discuss? And do you have a website or uh, how can people get in contact with you if they got any questions or comments or thoughts or all that good stuff? Uh, I don't have a website. The distillery has a website, East Tennessee Distillery. Um, I do have a Facebook page for Outlaw Spirits. And then my own personal Facebook page, which is how I usually keep in touch and keep up with everything. Um, but as far as 2019 goes, uh, most of the big plans going on this year are all still top secretive that I'm not allowed to discuss. But other than okay. that, I'm just doing my regular, what I call the dirty trail, getting out on the road and going to the festivals and events. And that all starts up here uh, next coming this next coming month, and then I'll, that'll go on pretty much through the end of the year. So that keeps me busy on the road. Okay. Well, and that's it. I, I do appreciate you coming on. I've had a great time and uh, made a new friend. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, you're very welcome. And you have a good night and a great weekend. Thank you, dear. You do the same. Okay, bye-bye. All right, bye. Well, wasn't that awesome? That was nothing like a great conversation with us. With a, uh, with a friend right up the road. Um, so I want to I wanna thank the Lady Outlaw for coming on the show. Nothing but respect for, you know, the job she's done, you know, uh, with her with her uh, spirits and uh, traveling and her family and farming and all that. That's, that's a lot of work. You, these Appalachian women, but they, they, some, they badass women, I tell you that right now. And we welcome her back anytime. Well, uh, for next week, Thursday, April 4th, uh, we'll have Erica Lukes. She's a researcher, activist, and historian. Erica is also an artist, a professional violinist, and host of the groundbreaking radio show UFO Classified. <coughs> Excuse me. So next week, UFOs and aliens. Yay! That's another great topic. So you all have a great weekend, and don't nobody get in too much trouble. And watch where you whisp, uh, sipping on that shine when you listen to this. Ooh, wee doggy. Let me see where it. There it is. Y'all have a good. That's one. it for us tonight. I want to thank everyone that took the time to listen in. I'd like to give a big shout out to the Vibe Radio Network and to Ryan for putting up with us. Also to all the first responders and our men and women in the armed services. Thank you for your service and the sacrifices that you and your families make 
every day to keep our great nation safe. Tune in next week to another exciting show starting at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Everyone can go to our Facebook page within the chaos and don't forget to like our page uh, to see upcoming guests along with past shows, postings, or you can also go to uh, my website at www.blackdiamondps.org or blogtalkradio.com forward slash vibe radio network. Also, we have a YouTube channel, so go to YouTube, look up Within the Chaos for past shows. Thanks again. Until next week, everyone have a safe weekend and have a good night and love you all. Be careful out there. Sorry, but I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. Those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass, and dictators die, and the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, Tell you what to do, what to think, or what to feel? Who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder? Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men, with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines, you are not cattle, you are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you, you the people have the power, the power to create machines, the power to create happiness, you the people have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure, then in the name of democracy, let us use that power, let us all unite, let us fight for a new world, a decent world. 
that will give men a chance to work, that will give you the future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! Have your devices just randomly stopped working? Are you having IT trouble? Not to worry, Mead's PC Repair Shop can help. We also offer IT support too, including website hosting. We are now also offering full event management services. To find out more, contact our friendly customer service team who will gladly help in any situation. Just call 276-880-8900 or if you prefer, you can stop by our shop at 1089 St. Clair Street, Oakwood, Virginia, 24631, by appointment only, or by visiting the website at meadspcshop.com for more information. Thank you. Blog Talk Radio. Alternative Facts. The following message is transmitted at the request of the United States government. At 12.07 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, numerous unidentified objects of unknown intent and unknown origin were detected at high altitudes over multiple locations of Earth's outer space by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and these objects are presumed to be some form of controlled aircraft. It is not known if more of these aircraft will arrive or if they will attempt entering Earth's atmosphere. United States citizens are encouraged to monitor local media outlets as more updates will follow us in. Prepare.